Sorry why I get set up. I have a lot of moving pieces. Oh my God. Okay. Is this okay that I move it a little bit? And also bring it down because I'm quite short. And, uh, you okay? Yeah. Okay. Nice to see you. <laughs> Good to see you. So he said this is a talk. I'm not going to call this a talk. It's more of a conversation amongst friends, since you are all my friends, I hope. Um, and if you've come here to learn about how to strive for coherence, you've come to the wrong place. I'm not giving you any formula. There is no, nothing I can necessarily teach you about how to live a coherent life. But I can offer some reflections on my own journey of trying to live a coherent life, um, as well as some of my other friends and colleagues who I've talked to about this particular um, subject. So I'm supposed to have some slides. I don't know if they're gonna show up. Oh, they are, they're here. <laughs> Thank you. And so um, I wanted to start by saying that this time of the year is, is it's a quite a special time of year for me, this early August. Um, and in reflection, I started thinking about all the wonderful things that have happened in my life around this time of year. Um, I met my husband around this time of year at the feast that happens this time. Uh, and we got married around this time of year 16 years ago. Um, <laughs> I attended uh, the 2000 youth conferences, uh, 2013 youth conferences around this time of year in Atlanta, and that will be important later. And uh, also at this time of year, last year, my family made the decision to move uh, from our home, which was Atlanta at the time, where we had lived for over a decade, to move to Jackson, Mississippi, a place that we had only visited twice at that point. And um, I will tell more, you more about that later. Let's see. Oh, it worked. All right. So. My dear friend Derek, I already gave you a lot of background on who I am. I thought many of you would be like, who is this woman that is on this panel or this plenary? I've never heard of her before, and that's okay. Um, I am just a person like most of you, and all these things that I have listed are the things that uh, shape the questions that I ask, they shape the lens of which I, I look at the world, and they're important for, for all of us to understand those things. So I'm a breast cancer researcher, as Derek mentioned. I'm a mother. I have two uh, small children, four, they're four and seven years old, Zayn and Badi. They're actually not here with us because they start school tomorrow morning at 7.30 a.m. in Jackson, so they're at home. Um, my husband, Nabil, is a professor at Jackson State University. He's a chemistry professor. And I also consider myself to be a community builder. As Derek mentioned, I'm an auxiliary board member for Mississippi, but I've also served the Ruhi Institute throughout the Southeast um, for well over a decade. So as many of you, I have all these aspects of my life that are very important. I can't take any of these things away. They, they actually um, are required for me to fulfill what I believe my purpose to be in this world. And so, Again, this is gonna be a reflection. You might all think about what are the very various aspects of my life that are important that allow me to contribute to my purpose. Okay, so I wanted to start by, when I had this opportunity to reflect, I started to think back to the moments that were important to me to shape who I am today. And so as I mentioned before, I attended this conference, a uh, youth conference in 2013, and there was a letter that the House of Justice wrote to the Baha'is of the world at that time, in February 8th, that called for these conferences to occur across the world. And initially they called for 95 conferences to happen, but due to the response, the enthusiasm, the many people who went to attend, they actually then had 114 conferences. I'm sure many of you in this room might have attended one, um, maybe let's have a show of hands. How many people attended one of these conferences? Okay, so a good amount. Okay, you can put your hands down. Like I said, this is a conversation. I'm gonna be asking you questions. I hope you raise your hand when I ask. Um, so when this, this letter came out, I distinctly remember reading this particular passage. And so the House of Justice wrote, beloved friends, to every generation of young believers comes an opportunity to make a contribution to the fortunes of humanity, unique to their time of life. For the present generation, the moment has come to reflect, to commit, to still themselves for a life of service from which blessings will flow in abundance. 
So this really struck me, and I know it struck many others um, who read this. And part of the, it struck me because some of the words, I just wasn't quite sure what it meant. I was like, to steal myself, what does that mean? I've only thought of steal as like a metal. Um, so like many others, I looked it up, and to steal means to mentally prepare oneself to do something that, or face something difficult. So, um, okay, I have to mentally prepare myself to do something that, that might be challenging or difficult, and what is this thing? Oh, it's a life of service. What's a life of service? Because up until this point, I grew up in a very dynamic and, and vibrant community. I, I'm from North Carolina. And service was a, much of a part of our lives, but I'd always heard of it, as, uh, especially as a youth, you, maybe you'll offer a period of service or a year of service, or you'll serve in Haifa for a time, and you'll come back, and then you'll do all the, uh, the, these other things. And so a life of service really stood out. Like, what does that mean to live a life of service? And so there are many things that I started to think about and, and had to give consideration to. So it became a pivotal moment, these youth conferences that occurred. And as I mentioned, the one that was held in Atlanta happened uh, in early August, almost 11 years to the day. And um, these are just some pictures from the, from the conference. Um, there are 650 youth from the Southeast, so um, South Carolina, Georgia, Alabama, Mississippi, and Florida who gathered for three days. Uh, they were 12-hour days. It was very intense, but it was also very joyful. Um, we explored such themes as the characteristics inherent for the period of youth, which Abdu'l-Bahá described as the choicest time of life. And also, it's a period of preparation. We studied the historical comp contributions of young people to the transformation of society, the responsibilities of the present generation of youth. Also, we studied about the society building powers of the Baha'i teachings. And also, we looked at the importance of faith and tenacity um, for a life of service. And so this gathering, which again, many of you were able to attend, maybe this one, the one in Atlanta, but many others, we found that this really set the trajectory for many young people. And so I wasn't able to gather examples from every young person that I know who, who had this experience and now can reflect on it some 11 years later, but I'll have a few examples throughout my talk or my conversation. And so I wanted to start with one friend who I just got permission to share of uh, this morning. Um, so it was described to me when she had come to this conference. At the time, she was in college, um, and she had become a Baha'i sometime in, in high school, and she felt like you know, she was struggling a little bit. She wasn't quite sure um, how to engage in her community. She wasn't immersed in community life. And also, she had just started a job. She had health care. She had benefits. She was in a good situation, um, or so some might have thought. And she was. Um, but after the conference, she was galvanized. She was inspired. She went home, and she started consulting with her auxiliary board member and the regional coordinator. And she decided she was going to serve uh, full time for a year, as many young people are able to offer this type of time. Um, and when she started to consult with her family, they said, what do you think you're doing? You have a job. You have benefits. You're going to do what? Um, but actually, it was really nice, because then it opened up a conversation and a consultation with her family. And she was able to offer that time of service. And they were able to see the impact on her and how her ability to serve her community really shaped her. And now she, um, she works in the field of public health. She has a family. She's living a vibrant life. And she still serves. I'm not going to give a lot of details. I told people I wouldn't disclose who they are. Um, but she, she's, the blessings are flowing in abundance. So I wanted to just look at another piece of, um, of guidance that the youth received at that time. So all the conferences received one letter, uh, the July 1st letter from the House of Justice, where um, there are many different things that were mentioned. But this one particular part stood out to me. And it said, you know well that the habits of mind and spirit that you are nurturing in yourselves and others will endure influencing decisions of consequence that relate to marriage, family, study, work, even where to live. Consciousness of this broad context helps to shatter the distorting looking glass in which everyday test, 
difficulties, setbacks, and misunderstandings can seem insurmountable. So again, this idea really stood out to me. Okay, I have to start developing habits of my mind, how I think about things, habits of my spirit, in order to make decisions that are gonna have a consequence for my whole life. And decisions that touch on all these various aspects that we were talking about earlier, of marriage, family, study, work, where to live. Um, and at the time, it was just starting to percolate what this all might mean. But um, to me, this is where the idea of coherence started to be introduced to the, to the young people. So what is coherence? How many times have we heard coherence this weekend? <laughs> we just hear this word all the time. Um, and it, it's, it's an important word. It's, it's actually, um, I think at that time, I didn't know what coherence really was. I heard it a lot too. And I, it had been really presented to me as balance. You balance things. And that's coherence, you know, if you kind of figure out how to make everything work, um, you know, make enough time for everything, then you're living a coherent life. And that wasn't quite right. Um, the definition is uh, the quality of forming a unified whole. But actually, Abdu'l-Baha talks about coherence in terms of the human body. He says, observe the human body its limbs, its members, the eye, the ear, the organs of smell, of taste, the hands, the fingernails. Notwithstanding the differences among all these parts, each one within the limitations of its own being participateth in a coherent whole. So we don't think of our bodies as just balancing acts, right? I don't think so. I'm a biologist, so please tell me you don't believe that's... <laughs> It's not just a balancing act, okay? Every, every member plays its part and all of it feeds into a coherent whole. Um, and so we have to give attention to all these things, but it, there, there are different aspects that maybe take more, um, more focus and, and come more to the center of our lives. Okay, so what is coherence? Um, the House of Justice, again, during these conferences, introduced this idea to the young people in the very first statement that we read. Um, and so this is just a piece of that statement. And in it, it said, it is essential that ever-growing numbers of those who, in the prime of their lives, steal themselves for a life of service to society. Naturally, many matters occupy their time and energy, education, work, leisure, spiritual life, physical health but they learn to avoid a fragmented approach to life that fails to see the connections among life's various aspects. Such a disjointed view of life often makes individuals fall victim to the false choices suggested in questions, such as whether one should study or serve, advance materially or contribute to the betterment of others, pursue work or become dedicated to service. Failure to approach one's life as a coherent whole often breeds anxiety and confusion. Through service, young people can learn to foster a life in which its various aspects complement each other. So who has not had this experience where they felt they had to choose between different things? I'm gonna, again, I, I'm mostly a researcher, but I also teach, and so I'm expecting some classroom feedback. <laughs> who has ever felt like they had to decide between study and service? How about work and service? How about family and service? Okay. Good. If you didn't raise your hand, you should be up here giving the, the, this talk. <laughs> Not me, because you're obviously living a coherent life. I also didn't offer all the choices, but I feel like all of us have been at a place where we felt like maybe we had to make some choices or we felt this kind of fragmentation in our lives. In this one space, I'm like this. In this other space, I'm like this, and I don't know how it's all going to fit together. And so in this aspect, they're saying that these are false choices, actually. It doesn't mean that there's not different things that we do with our time, but they should be somehow feeding into this coherent whole. And so at this point, I want to um, share another example. So I'm gonna keep showing this picture because all of these people that I'm talking about are somewhere in this picture. And if you can spot them, I know it's kind of blurry. If you think you know who they are, extra credit at the end of the talk. Okay, so <laughs> this friend, um, I talked, I, we were reflecting together about this idea of coherence, 
And um, he, he was also struck by a lot of the same things that I was when we were studying these various messages in preparation for the conference. He started studying them with other people and realizing he didn't quite understand coherence either. He said it was a, he had a very simple understanding. He felt it just meant I should make more time to serve. Um, and so after the conference, um, he was an engineer. He is, he's trained as an engineer. And uh, he was working at an engineering firm. He liked his job and everything, but he still felt like he should be giving more time to service. And so at some point, he approached his boss and he said, can I have some more time off so I can spend more time doing these things? And his boss, what do you think his boss said? Absolutely not. Are you out of your mind? Get out of my office. I don't know if he said those exact words, but that's what I think he probably said. So my friend actually, he said, okay, well, let me go. I'm gonna actually interview with a couple other engineering firms and see what they say. And so they actually gave him the time that he had requested. So he went back to his boss and he said, see, <laughs> I've got some other offers. They're willing to give me more time off. And so the boss said, okay, I'll give you some more time off. But that's not where this friend's story ends. He actually, as he, after the conference starts, um, participating more in the Ruhi Institute process. He's in the field. He's engaging in conversations in his community. And he starts realizing that the questions that are starting to arise more and more are around public health. And he realizes that what he's doing in his engineering work wasn't quite addressing the needs of his community. So he went back to school while still working and got a, a master's in public health. And based on what was going on in his various classes, he decided to pursue a degree in epidemiology and biostats. And so at this point, he, when he has to get a job in his field, he gets a, a job at a university. And so if any of you have worked in a university, working in engineering in a university is very different. The pay scale is very different. So he comes in, they're like, what was your previous pay? You're not getting that, no way. <laughs> cut that in, I don't know how much he makes, but I'm assuming cut it in half, at least. Okay, so he's like, okay, I'm taking a pay cut, but this is gonna serve my community. Okay, um, well, I'm gonna need some time off because I serve in the field, and also he was a facilitator for the Institute in Studies for Global Prosperity. And so every summer he gives around 10 to 12 days to, to offer the service. So he says, this is what I do. I need more than, he was getting 10 days off at the time. Because I also have a family, and we like to visit our family. We need those vacation days. We can't take those only to be in the field of service. So actually, the chair of his department said, can you describe to me what it is that you do with these 10 days? So he wrote this beautiful letter to the chair of the department that I actually use <laughs> myself when I ask for, for time off and describe the aims of the uh, Institute for Studying Global Pros of Global Prosperity. Uh, he described how it aims to help university students participate in relevant discourses for society and builds their capacity. And the chair said, wow, this is exactly what our department wants people to do. We want people to be learning how to do these things, and we would love for you to serve in this way. So I'm going to use departmental funds to fund you during these days off. Yeah, it's really great. <laughs> and this, um, but to me, it was such an example of someone making an effort to live a coherent life and then also bringing other people into this conversation, consulting with them and sharing with them and realizing that a lot of people actually agree these are things that we should be doing with our time. So to me, I love that example. And again, he is thriving, living a very wonderful life. Blessings are flowing in abundance for him. He actually offered a lot of um, reflections, but given to time, I will not be able to share everything. Okay. So one of the things when we think about um, coherence, part of what's important to understand is our purpose. So what is our purpose? So I have a little demonstration. We'll see how it works. Can anybody see what this is? You guys can't tell what it is, right? It's a pen. It's a writing utensil. If you didn't know what it was, what might be some of the things that you would do with this object? Anyone? Stab some? Oh, goodness. <laughs> oh, no. OK. Uh, no more <laughs> audience feedback. I will give you. 
<laughs> the right answers. No, actually my friend used this example when we were talking to young people before, and so I've heard various things that people would do past that. And so some people say, I would drum with it. You know, I could use it to drum. Um, poke, poke things is another thing that people said they would do. Some people said they might use it as a dart. Some people say they might use it to eat. There's various things you could do with a pen, right? Okay, but what is the purpose of a pen? To write. You can create art. You can write poetry. You can write equations. You can communicate to other people. It has such a higher purpose than the things that you could do with it. So similarly, our lives have a, a real purpose. We could do many things with our lives, but there's actually something higher that it's created to do. So we can think about purpose in, in various levels. Um, we can think about the purpose of the revelation. So Baha'u'llah says, is not the object of every revelation to effect a transformation in the whole character of mankind, a transformation that shall manifest itself both outwardly and inwardly, that shall affect both its inner life and external conditions. So this is the purpose of revelation, and we see that there's this dual nature to it. There's an inner aspect, the inner life of mankind as a whole, but there's also an outer aspect, these external conditions that need to transform as well. And individuals are the same, actually. We have various purposes that have these kind of duality to it. So Baha'u'llah says, the purpose of the one true God in manifesting himself is to summon mankind to truthfulness and sincerity, to piety and trustworthiness, to resignation and submissiveness to the will of God, to forbearance and kindliness, to uprightness and wisdom. His object is to array every man with the mantle of a saintly character and to adorn him with the ornament of holy and goodly deeds. He also says the purpose of God in creating man hath been and will ever be to enable him to know his creator and to attain his presence. So in many ways, he describes this inner world, this inner life that is part of our purpose, that, that we are gonna develop all these spiritual attributes and that we are going to be able to know our creator and to attain his presence. But he also describes another aspect to our purpose. He says, O oh, people of God, do not busy yourselves in your own concerns. Let your thoughts be fixed upon that which will rehabilitate the fortunes of mankind and sanctify the hearts and souls of men. All men have been created to carry forward an ever advancing civilization, and all men have been called into being for the betterment of the world. It behooveth every soul to arise and serve his brethren for the sake of God. So similarly, we have these two purposes. We have this purpose to really develop this inner life, our spiritual qualities, but also the, in that we can actually serve mankind, that we contribute to the betterment of the world. This is why we were called into being. This is our highest purpose. If you remember before in one of the quotes where it talks about this distorting looking glass that we must shatter, sometimes the world tells us we have a different purpose. What are some of the purposes the world tells us that we have? Make money, retire early. <laughs> These are, this is for the United States. This is all the world tells us no. But um, it is, we very, our material being is at the center. We should make sure we live a very comfortable life, that we have enough money, that you know, we're happy, all these things. And none of those things are actually mentioned in the purposes that Baha'u'llah has written about why we're here. <laughs> so these are things we could do with our lives, of course, and we do, but there's, these are, there's a higher purpose, a higher calling. And so it's often referred to as our twofold moral purpose or twofold purpose to attend to one's own spiritual and intellectual growth and to contribute to the transformation of society. So when we think of our purpose in this way, we can think about why we might want to live a coherent life, why we might want to strive to have these various life's aspects really complement each other to become a unified whole. Okay, so I have another, another example from a very close friend. Okay, so this friend, um, he's a scientist, and he views uh, science as a way to benefit man's life. He says knowledge is as wings um, to man's life, which actually Baha'u'llah says that, but he said, he quotes this quite often. And he also had intellectual curiosity. Um, and so prior to the conferences, he was pursuing a PhD in chemistry, 
and uh, he chose a particular project that focuses on solar energy and developing um, new materials so that more people can have access to solar energy. And so obviously good things, right? None of this is bad. But he started to think a little bit more about his life, his purpose. And so once he finished his PhD, he did something that was not common for those in academia. He offered uh, two years of full-time service uh, because there was a need in his community. And so his advisor said, okay, what do you think you're doing? But best wishes, um, because usually having a gap in your CV, your, I don't know what CV stands for, but you know what I mean, uh, your resume, your CV. It doesn't look very good, especially if you want to re-enter academia. But he said, this is the need, and I've prayed and I've been confirmed, so I'll do it. Um, but he started to, um, a couple years into it, or maybe a year and a half, he, was, he had to go back to work. He had to receive uh, his, uh, you know, attain his true calling. He has to have a profession like all of us have to at some point in, the, in our lives. And so he started to pursue different lines to see where he might go. Um, and so he actually got a, a nice uh, interview with this big tech company. They flew him out. They were like, we love that you were doing community service for two years. What a wonderful person you are. Once you get here, you will not do that anymore. So we're glad you did that now. So he said, oh, no, that's, <laughs> I don't think this is going to work out. Thank you for your offer. And he came back home. Um, but then at the same time, he similarly was engaged in the institute process and he was going around in the neighborhood and trying to find young people who were interested in engaging in the community building activities of the Baha'i community. So he was on a college campus uh, that is close to the neighborhood that he was uh, working in and he found that all these young people were quite receptive. All of them or a lot of them <laughs> wanted to engage in these activities. And so he started thinking to himself, well, maybe I could find a job here, because then I could work here, and I could meet all these young people and invite them. And so he, he printed off his CV, and like one does, no one does this, he goes in and he says, where's the chair of the chemistry department? And they're like, he's not here, but you can leave, some, you can leave this with me. And he did, he left his CV with um, the administrative aid for the, the department chair. And then a, a day or two later, he receives a call from the chair. This is great. We would love for you to work here. Can you start <laughs> uh, in a few weeks? How many of you have ever walked into a, a place with just your CV, asked to see the head of the department, and got a job? No one. I was like, I've never heard of such. But he lives a very unique life. This is just the confirmations he receives from God. Um, and they, they told him, okay, well, you know, we haven't had a 10-year track position open for over a decade. So you're really just going to be, this is more of adjuncting. This is not a permanent position. He said, that's fine. So he was teaching. He was inviting his students to join him in the community building activities. And they were, and it was going really well. And within a year, a tenure track position opened up, and he got it. <laughs> um, so for him, similarly, he said all he was doing was trying to, to really pray and consult and try to see how the various aspects of his life could, could align and, and be unified, and he did receive these confirmations. Okay. So one thing I also want to mention, you hear I'm keeping bringing up the institute process, and. Um, one thing that's important to note is that none of these friends that I'm sharing about just came to this realization on their own. They're not, they don't just wake up and say, you know what, I'm gonna live a coherent life. Um, formal training is needed. None of us get to where we are without having some systematic formal training, whether in our profession or even in our spiritual lives. And The Guardian talks a lot about how youth should be well-educated and trained in the teachings. They should require, acquire thorough and sound knowledge of the faith. Um, in addition, sorry, my notes are, I gotta flip them. Um, in addition, uh, he talks about them needing to have active and wholehearted and continue participation in the activities of their community. That really, uh, community life is like a laboratory, an indispensable laboratory uh, where young people can translate into living um, 
these constructive principles. They can translate these principles into action. And so what I have up here, he, the Guardian refers to the need for youth to develop both their intellectual and spiritual capacities as part of their preparation for the future. He said, you ought to be well equipped. You ought to have your intellectual as well as spiritual side equally developed. So again, in our society, how much is our spiritual side focused on? How many years do we spend just K through 12 education? Is that 13 years? Then a lot of us go on to post-secondary training. For me, I don't want to add it up, but let's see. 13 years, then I did another four years, then I did another two years, then I did another six years, and then I did another more trainings. Like, my whole life has been spent in this intellectual training. But how much attention has been given to my spiritual training? Well, lucky for me, I've been a part of this community, so a lot. But some of my other friends have not received the same level of attention, this constant thought about their spiritual side being equally developed. So the institute process is formal education. It is a way in which that we can receive our formal education. Um, the House of Justice writes, one of the most effective instruments at your disposal in this respect is the Training Institute. It strives to engage the individual in an educational process in which virtuous conduct and self-discipline are developed in the context of service, fostering a coherent and joyful pattern of life that weaves together study, worship, teaching, community building, and in general, involvement in other processes that seek to transform society. At the heart of the educational process is contact with the word of God, whose power sustains every individual's attempts to purify his or her heart and to walk a path of service with the feet of detachment. So really, this is such an important component to the training that we all need, that it actually helps us to attain our true purpose and to live a more coherent life, not just in the field of expansion and consolidation, but also in our ability to have vibrant professional lives and the lives of our family. All of these things are interconnected. So I wanna talk a little bit more about the role of the Institute. Um, so one thing that it says within the very first part of uh, book one, for, in A Few Thoughts to the Tutor, it says, it is Baha'u'llah's vision of the individual we can become and of the civilization that we can build that inspires the Institute. So that's what inspires the Institute. Again, it is only like, solely focused on how to develop us so that we can attain our purpose. The House of Justice also says, specifically, the courses of the Institute are intended to set the individual on a path in which qualities and attitudes, skills and abilities are gradually acquired through service. Service intended to quell the insistent self, helping to lift the individual out of its confines and placing him or her in a dynamic process of community building. The House of Justice also writes, Understanding the implications of the revelation, both in terms of individual growth and social progress, increases manifold when study and service are joined and carried out concurrently. There in the field of service, knowledge is tested, questions arise out of practice, and new levels of understanding are achieved. And so again, it's not just about our spiritual side being just study, but actually it's through both the study and service. And actually this framework applies for anything. We are able to, if we really study in this field of service, the questions that come from it, the way that we look at the world can then shape all the other aspects of our lives. What profession do I choose? What are the questions that are coming out of my real conversations with friends? And how do I, I think about what that means for me and how I shape my life? I also wanted to mention that even within the first book of the Ruhi Institute, Reflections on the Life of the Spirit, we start to build the requisite capacities to fulfill our purpose. Um, we learn about how we should pray daily, that we should study the word of God in the morning and in the evenings. We learn to bring ourselves to account each day. And we learn to apply the teachings to transform our inner lives and society. So if we, if we all think that we just do those four things on a regular basis, that we can actually achieve, achieve coherence. Actually, even within the first unit, first section of the first unit, we start thinking about how to even align our thoughts and our actions. Um, 
There's quotes such as, beware, O people of Baha, lest ye walk in the ways of them whose words differ from their deeds. And also say, O brethren, let deeds, not words, be your adorning. So these type of things where we have to start, again, coherence in our thoughts and our actions and how we, we think about our contributions are so important. And all of this starts being addressed from the very outset of the institute process and continues forward through the sequence of courses as we develop our capacities and start to, to offer more um, complex acts of service. So the moment you've all been waiting for, you get to hear about me. No, you haven't been waiting for that. But <laughs> this, is, this is getting to the end, and I will share um, a little bit about my own journey. So um, I will skip to this time last year. Actually, I'll, I'll go to March 2023. Um, and so at this point, we had received the nine-year plan a while ago. And I actually, um, I was on the job market. I, wasn't planning on leaving Atlanta. I just had to go on the job market for, for appearances purposes. And um, I had an offer from the institution I was, I was already at. It's a top institution. It's great for my field. Obviously, God wants me to be in Atlanta. So I had the privilege of going on a three-day visit to the Holy Land. And I said, when I get there, I'm going to pray for um, how I can serve the nine-year plan. I'll pray for my profession and this decision I have to make. And I'll pray for my family. So I prayed for those three things. And I, but I already knew, I thought I knew, I was like, I already know these answers. So this is really just, uh, I just want to be close to the Holy Land. The day I land, I receive an email from the University of Mississippi Medical Center. Now, whether I was bringing myself to account each day, I don't know what was going on, but I wrote to them saying, I'm busy. <laughs> I'm really busy right now, and I'm not sure that I can, can talk with you all. I, I have another offer, all these things. And the woman actually wrote me, uh, there was a few people on the email, but one woman wrote me separately and said, I thought you were still um, on the job market and we are looking for someone in cancer health equity and we think you'd be really good fit for this role. Well, I am really interested in cancer health equity and um, I don't know how much you know about Mississippi, but of all the states, it has the highest breast cancer mortality rate. It has the highest rate of the most aggressive form of breast cancer. So really, it's an area of great need. And so I said to myself, well, you know what? I can go over there. I can meet people. I'll collaborate with them. And then also, it's summertime. I can meet with the Baha'is. I can help with their summer activities. This will be a great opportunity to just go to Mississippi. So I go. And sometimes it's a mystical thing. All of a sudden, I start feeling through the conversations that I'm having with people, the sincerity of the desire to work towards a more equitable future for not just Mississippians, for the world, their engagement in the community. Things started to feel like, actually, this might be a, a place, a nice place. So I called my husband and I said, Mississippi's really nice. And he said, are we moving to Jackson? And I was like, that's not what I said, but it's nice. Um, but it started this conversation. And actually in Atlanta, it was a summer of service. And I came back and I looked and I saw that there's this vibrant community life. There are so many people doing this great work. And it was a lot of contrast to what was happening in Mississippi. There weren't that many Baha'is. There was a small band of believers trying their best, but they didn't have the same resources. So that was also part of the consideration. So um, my husband and I had also been reading the July 22nd, 2020 message from the House of Justice, where we were considering this one piece where it said, every believer, as the promulgator of Baha'u'llah's central principle of the oneness of humanity, should deeply meditate upon it in ways demanding implications for the profound alteration of thought and action required at this time. And so we said, well, what are maybe some profound alterations of thought and action that might be required at this time to achieve oneness? And for us, we thought maybe to help achieve oneness is not for us to stay where we are very comfortable, we are happy. Um, but to maybe to seek whether we should go somewhere else where there aren't as many resources, where there is a need, both in our professional lives, but also to serve the faith. 
uh, for our region, it's a goal for Ma Jackson to reach the third milestone by the end of this plan, actually by 2026. And so in consultation, again, with the, the counselor, with the other auxiliary board members, with our families, we made this decision to, to move to Jackson. And so we moved um, December 27th, and we've been there a little over seven months. And I just wanted to share with you that blessings did flow in abundance. These are all pictures of the various activities that are happening in this community. There's been youth gatherings. There's been studies of various messages with the friends. Communities have hold gatherings. Um, there's new devotional gatherings. There are children that come to my house out of nowhere to play basketball all the time, uh, a young believer declared. Um, and then also professionally, I've been able to make a lot of great friends with my colleagues. We are starting to really tackle some very important issues. And so um, my husband wanted me to mention that we hadn't just done all this work on our own. It's not just the fact that we um, that we're doing all these things, that this is why there's all these blessings, but there is something about sacrifice and people willing to do something that, that does release um, uh, blessings to flow in addition to living these coherent lives. And so I just found out that we've, since we've moved, we've doubled the number of core activities that are there, so from 20 to 41, um, and we are well on our way to making our goal of reaching the third milestone. Um, So I just wanted to end with a few last thoughts. Um, and I've mentioned some of this as I've been sharing these examples, that it's not just these young people who on their own are making these decisions about how to, where to work, where to work, how much time to serve. It's really a consultation with various um, members of society. <laughs> and so the House of Justice writes that the significant decisions that they make about the direction of their li adult lives will determine whether service to the cause of God was only a brief and memorable chapter of their younger years or a fixed center of their earthly existence, a lens through which all actions come into focus. We rely on you and your auxiliaries to ensure that the spiritual material prospects of the youth are given due weight in the deliberations of families, communities, agencies, and institutions. So this is really all of our concern. Um, and while it's speaking about the youth, all of us can be reflecting on, is service at the fixed center of my life? Was it something that was just a memorable period of time? And how might I start to align things? And who are the people that I can consult with? My family, my community, the agencies, the institutions, and all of us together will help for us to achieve our purpose individually and collectively. I also want to share just two things from the most recent uh, Rizwan message about this present hour. So the first part, the methods and instruments of the plan allow every soul to contribute a share of what humanity needs in this day. Far from offering a temporary salve for the ills of the moment, the prosecution of the plan is the means by which long-term constructive processes unfolding over generations are being set in motion in every society. All of this points to an urgent, inescapable conclusion. There must be a sustained, rapid rise in the number of those committing their time, their energy, their concentration to the success of this work. So again, this is a moment of reflection. The House of Justice is calling on all of us to reflect on how we might be able to be of those who are a part of this rapid rise in the number of those committing their time, their energy, their concentration to the success of this work. And as is mentioned, all of us are able to think about what are the ways in which we contribute. Not everyone is going to serve in the exact same way, but all of us will, will serve so that we are able to, um, to address the needs of humanity for today. And lastly, you know, I've, wanted to end on a note where sometimes, even though steel means to prepare yourself for something that is difficult, um, there's also joy, right? In the, in the last paragraph, the urgency of the present hour must not obscure the special joy that comes from service. The call to serve is an uplifting, all-embracing summons. It attracts every faithful soul, even those weighed down by cares and obligations. 
for in all the ways in which that faithful soul is occupied can be discovered deep-rooted devotion and a lifelong concern for the well-being of others. Such qualities give coherence to a life of manifold demands. In the sweetest moments of all for any enkindled heart are those spent with spiritual sisters and brothers tending to a society in need of spiritual nourishment. So my spiritual sisters and brothers, we have a lot of work ahead, but we are in a very sweet moment as well. And I really look forward to hearing more of your own reflections, learning about how we can together support each other as we try to live coherent lives and achieve our purposes both individually and collectively. Thank you so much.